The concept of the digital divide is not new. It's a concept that researchers, scholars, practitioners have been talking about for decades. The digital divide is when we think about inequities between uh, who has access to what in schools. But the divide is actually deeper than that. So let me take a step back. The digital divide is often associated with access. Access to technology, access to Wi-Fi, access to tech tools, these types of things. The digital divide is actually deeper than that. And what happens is it's not only access to tools or technology, it's what happens with those tools in teaching and learning. So it's the type of activities that students have access to and use that technology. And there are some very stark differences when we start break breaking things down by uh, race, class, gender. And that's more what the digital divide is. What is the digital divide? In, in, in my words, the digital divide, I, I think about that through two lenses. Um, that first lens is really for our students. What is that digital divide like for our, for our students um, and our families? And um, in, in my eyes and in my words, that is um, like an access level at home, um, and not just at home, but access level in general with internet, with um, hardware at home, um, and also with kind of competencies. So, you know, depending on your parents' job, you may have, you know, more involved parents, more, more tech savvy. Um, and through the lens of staff, I think to me the digital divide um, starts with, you know, we have some teachers who have just kind of always had a passion for technology and been into it, and other teachers who have been more reluctant to it. And I think that's, that's across the board for teachers, for principals, for, um, for any role within a school. And so I, I think for me the digital divide uh, through the lens of, of like our staffing, um, really is more of a skills approach, but for families at home, uh, focus on that like access and skill level and affordability, affordability and availability at home. So the digital divide um, and how it relates both to our school district, both before and after COVID or during COVID, if you will, um, is extraordinary. And so I think prior to COVID, I always recognize the importance of ensuring access for all of our students and our families, particularly with technology, recognizing that the days that you and I and others may have been in school, it was all about the textbook, right? And we're reading the textbook. Well, textbooks now in the age of technology are out of date by the time that they are printed. And so it really is about access to information and that can't happen without technology. So there, are, there isn't enough money, there's not enough training, there's not enough anything to avoid or to prevent um, folks from needing technology. And so we take that seriously in our schools and wanna make sure that every student and family has access to that technology. And we believe that's an essential part of everything that we do. Um, during COVID, um, there particularly has shined a light on what that looks like, particularly for students in poverty, students in situations where there's been a lot of transition, perhaps from school to school or district to district or city to city, particularly for families who are living in rural areas, perhaps, that don't have access to internet, um, regardless of what they do. And so it's it's forced in a positive way school districts to be more collaborative and deliberate about making sure that every student and family has access. And so as the days and the weeks went on, we recognized that the first step was really making sure that every family had access, but the next step then was making sure every child had access, recognizing that some families have multiple students at multiple levels and require different amounts of access. And so it forced us to really work with our students and our families around not only having a device and not only having reliable internet, but then providing training for students and parents about online accesses. So working with a kindergartner to learn a new program uh, is not easy to do. And we spent a lot of time working with families to better understand our systems and thinking about ways that we can make that smoother or better for families so that we could partner in that uh, educational journey. People assume that because you are a young person, you know inherently how to use technology for learning. Um, but in fact, we train students from the moment they're in kindergarten up how to use a technology, whether it's for something basic like word processing or searching, finding accurate sources, um, 
how to use technology to learn and to show what you know. And so if you have not had access to that type of teaching and learning, if you have not had access to teachers who spend the time using the technology in the classroom, showing the students how to use these tools for learning, you likely are experiencing the digital divide um, in yourself and in your experience as a student. And so I think we just assume that Generation Z, our students right now, they're always on their phones, they're always doing that stuff, but that's a huge leap um, to learning and understanding and being engaged in school um, online. So disparities that we saw pre-COVID, I think what, and especially in my role as a, as a like, director of technology, um, I think what, what I saw the most of was the access at home. So it was specific to, like we run a bring your own device system and we would have students with like a brand new MacBook Pro um, next to a student running like their hand-me-down eight-year-old Chromebook. Um, and we were asking those students to do the same thing, access the same resources, um, do some of the same work at home. Um, but th those are two kind of very varying ends, like very far ends of the spectrum. At the same time, that is also kind of at the beginning of us identifying these like broadband challenges within our school district as well. So we we knew that like no, it was no secret that there was inequities in the in the school district in regard to like internet service provider and access at home. Um, there's a, like a number of projects happening within our community through the Chamber of Commerce and the um, county to get some additional broadband funding. Um, but it, at the beginning of that, it, it really was um, like some families unable to connect. And I would say one thing like from a teacher's lens that I've heard is that like those inequities around student access really became I think clear and a lot more a part of our conversation through distance learning as well. Because I think it's it's really easy to see, you know, there isn't a student on this Google Meet every day or, um, you know, there's somebody dropping off my calls and the, our teachers um, were working as hard as they can to, you know, call families, connect with families. We knew these inequities existed. Um, COVID really expanded that. And I think having all of our teachers like experience that firsthand in distance learning has really brought that conversation to the forefront and to me that's that's one of the positives out of all this as well. During the pandemic in Minnesota when we've shifted to online or distance learning there are many examples of the digital divide um, being hyper present in the state. Some things that became visible right away were access to internet or Wi-Fi. So one of the things that probably all school districts did in the state, were offer Wi-Fi hotspots. And they would distribute those to families or families would come pick those up. So they're trying to check that box, making sure that every student, every family had Wi-Fi access. Now where that breaks down a little bit is how many people in the home are using that Wi-Fi? So during a pandemic, it depends on how many people are in the home, how many, um, if there are three children in the home, and they're all streaming live classes, that Wi-Fi breaks down really quickly. So that's just one example of uh, some inequities in high-powered internet access that is impacting teaching and learning in the state. Within the community, like broadband access um, is, is all over the board. Um, if you talk with the two community organizations uh, that are working on broadband in the community, which is the uh, Chisago Lakes Chamber of Commerce and the county working with um, Blanded Foundation. They would say that um, part of the challenge is there's one internet service provider to a lot of different places. And um, like while that may say you could get 10 megabit at your house, um, in reality that might mean like 1.2. The school district I work in uh, goes all the way over to the Wisconsin border. Um, kind of over into the St. Croix River Valley there, which is a, a beautiful part of the state, um, but that comes along with it some like challenging geography as well, where like you can't get cell service in part of that. Um, a lot of trees, <laughs> and so uh, and a lot of those families that live out in that rural part of the state um, don't necessarily have access to broadband either. So our focus was really on you know how can we like long term get some high speed internet to all of our communities. homes. So one of the first things we did was work to source hotspots. And that was, um, you know, part of my role right at the beginning of the state shutdown. There was to look for, um, you know, we know if we have families that don't have internet at home, they just don't have access right now, and they will need access. So um, we're going to try to get some mobile hotspots in place, and you know that comes with its own challenges because we're a smaller district looking to buy some hotspots at the same time everybody else is looking to do about the same thing, 
whether it's hotspots, whether it's devices. So um, <laughs> that, that comes with its own set of challenges. But um, we were able to deploy and work with some families to get um, hotspots in place um, in, in some homes. Uh, but we also had did a lot of work around just trying to find creative ways to help students get connected to the internet. So last spring, and coming into this fall, we, we did some things like just like very publicly trying to share, oh, here is where our free guest internet is available from our schools. Here are some other areas within the community that we can do that. A few other ways that uh, the switch to emergency remote teaching and learning was inequitable is um, for families that still had to go to work. Maybe you worked fast food, maybe you did a job where you physically had to go in. You didn't work for a company that allowed you to work from home. That means that you did not have an adult in the home uh, when the student was going online or maybe uh, the student goes to daycare where you have one daycare worker who's trying to help all of these students get online at different times or complete their assignments. Uh, that's a huge inequity of how many adults are helping you through this uh, remote learning process as well. So I will say that this situation has not affected the digital divide at all. It has just put a magnifying glass on an issue that was already present, but people chose to turn an eye to it. Um, we have always been experiencing these inequities and just simply by providing access to devices does not provide an equitable form of education because if you've had computers in your home all your life, if you're given a laptop by a school, you inherently know generally how to use that laptop. If you have never touched a laptop, never had access to a device, your primary primary form of accessing the internet, accessing information, maybe it was on a more affordable mobile phone, you are not starting at the same point using that device. And this situation just really forced people to look at that issue in a way that they couldn't turn their heads in the past.